Greeting stranger. Good morning once again. I am pleased to report that my prayers to Hansper the Water Rat seem to have been answered, for our journey along the Arthrosh has been swift. Oregant awaits us. You can see it there, on the southern bank. We will be continuing northwards across Darkmoon Plain, but I think it wise first to get some proper rest on dry land before sallying forth onto that treacherous landscape. Therefore, we will be disembarking shortly. Before we do, though, I would like to give you a tour of the town. Similar to my tour of Almas, I think it would be best to conduct one from the deck of the ship rather than attempt to navigate the rather dilapidated streets by foot or carriage. Besides, in point of fact, a large part of the town is essentially off-limits to those of us who do not work for the powerful Lumber Consortium, which is headquartered here. As soon as we entered the cut yards or lumber lodges vicinity, the hired thugs that pass as guards would sick their hounds on us both. I, for one, would rather not make a scene here. Actually, I would prefer not to be recognized at all by the locals. The last time I was in Oregon, well, I did not exactly see eye to eye with the gavel. Ah, but I get ahead of myself. Come, join me here on the prow and cast your eyes over yonder. And let me tell you about the capital of the Dark Moon Vale region. Originally under Chelaxian rule, Oregant was considered little more than a humble logging town in the Arthfell region of the Andorran province for some time. After all, at the time, there was little to no distinction made between the Arthfell forest and the Dark Moon wood, for the two blended together. However, this all changed with the coming of Taris Rakesclaw and his vision for a revitalized lumber consortium. To understand one, you must understand the other. As a business enterprise, the consortium has existed for almost 3,000 years, having been founded in 1853 in Andoran back when it was still a province of the Empire of Taldor. As far as historians can discern, the consortium quietly but diligently served the needs of the province for lumber without making waves, as the Steel Falcons would put it. Its growth was modest but steady, and by the time Karas Novotnian spearheaded the colonization of the Dark Moon Vale in 4113, the consortium had lined itself up as the first enterprise to reap the New Frontier's profits. At the time, the consortium was actually owned by Karas Novotnian's nephew, Berendo, who founded the town of Ulfden to serve as the barony's capital and base for his logging enterprise. The consortium did not concern itself with processing. It would simply transport and sell the timber to various independent companies in the south, mostly headquartered in Oregon. Berendo's business partner was one Lord René Rakesclaw, a minor noble who owned many of the cut yards that processed the consortium's trees. It turned out to be quite the successful partnership, so much so, in fact, that Lord René's grandson, Taris, acquired the capital necessary to purchase the consortium from the Novotnian family outright. This purchase would have dire consequences for Oregon and Andoran as a whole, though I am sure very few people noticed the monopolistic nature of the purchase at the time, and those who did doubtless helped to facilitate it. Once the young Rakesclaw had solidified a local monopoly, he began to leverage his assets against competitors. The grip did not tighten immediately, but over the next century or so, overseen by Taris and his descendants, the entirety of Andoran's private logging industry was consolidated into the consortium. The Rakesclaws also maintained a steady supply of generous donations to the Chalaxian authorities, who, quite coincidentally, never acknowledged the now provincial monopoly as a problem. After all private competitors were dealt with, the Lumber Consortium turned its gaze to the Andoran government. The province had always maintained its own public logging industry to help employment, guarantee a reserve of lumber, and generally adhere to sound economic principles. The consortium took offence at this, and lobbied very hard to privatise those assets. Once again, coins found their way to the right people, and the province legislated to sell their assets to the consortium, who wasted no time in making various adjustments to the previous economic formula. 
By the time the Age of Lost Omens began and House Thrun came to rule Cheliax in 4640, the Consortium's power was frightening and more or less absolute in the Darkmoon Vale. The Chalish Civil War heralded dark times for the Consortium, though, for this new infernal empire's ruling classes were not interested in permitting third parties to wield real authority. Thus began a period of steady decline for the company, until the People's Revolt of 4669. The Lumber Consortium, tired of their cardinal prophets being throttled from afar, openly supported the secessionists, much to the dismay of the Andoran nobility. The board of directors came to a mutually beneficial arrangement with the flourishing Andoran government, a deal that has been begrudgingly respected ever since. In essence, the Lumber Consortium mostly confines itself to the forests, permits a token number of independent loggers along the rim of the Verduren, and limits its lobbying to well, shall we say, normal levels. In exchange, they are allowed to rule the Darkmoon Vale region from their arrogant headquarters with minimal governmental oversight. A win for everyone, except, of course, the people who actually need to live there. And this brings us back to Oregant. Without this context, it might be unclear exactly why it has been allowed to fester as a rundown, slum-like town for so long, despite ostensibly being a proud regional capital. The Lumber Consortium is your answer. Travelling through Oregon is a depressing experience. Its folk are oppressed, there is no other way to phrase it, and they know it. Oregon is where all the Andoran rhetoric about freedom and democracy goes to die, choked by the sawdust of the cutyards that were night and day. Officially, of course, the town is governed by its representative on the People's Council, currently one Drogan Spites. Before his retirement, Mr. Spites was a senior figure in, surprise, the Lumber Consortium. The company's influence on the town's nominal government has always been something of an open secret, but this act of corruption was perhaps a little too brazen. In response, the People's Council in Almas appointed one Elsbet Regere as the town's magistrate, that is, a chief law officer. As an anointed champion of Iomade and member of the Golden Legion, it is hoped in Almas that she will investigate the election impartially. I do not know how successful she has been since I last visited the town, but I do know that she has no qualms about kicking hornet nests. It will be most interesting to observe how much progress she can actually make. Despite this one beacon of hope, the town remains firmly under the consortium's control. Oregentan culture is quite sobering to most Andorans who visit the town in stark contrast to the upbeat, almost chirpy attitudes of many of the common folk, Oregentans are wont to assess and appraise everything thrice over before committing to a course of action, be it a business transaction, a social event, or even intervening to save a dying man's life. This extreme caution has been quite literally beaten into many locals by the consortium's enforcers, who enjoy reminding them that nothing in life comes free. Almost all land is owned by the company, including wherever your house rests. Thus, if you step out of line, you lose not only your job, but also your home. Wages are scarcely enough to keep one out of poverty, as many coins are automatically deducted to maintain property and other company infrastructure. Yes, indeed, for many workers, the Lumber Consortium does not just own the land, but the house itself as well. A unique feature of the town, and perhaps the only one that is not related to the lumber industry, is its enthusiasm for bells. From tiny handheld bells to enormous one-ton temple bells that need proper training to ring safely, the town is never free of their ringing. They adorn the thresholds of buildings, they are strung along the roads between them, and they sound with the wind day and night. The reason for this is hardly a love of campanology, but rather a healthy respect for the local geology. Oregant, as well as much of Darkmoon Vale, is built along what the druids would call a fault line, that is to say a part of Galarian exposed to its tremors. Earthquakes are common here, 
and while most are harmless, occasionally the locals must endure a depressing level of natural destruction. Oregon's bells signal for many more happenings than just earthquakes, however. In fact, there exists a fully developed system of signals and call and response chimes that every Oregonian learns from childhood. The city guards even have their own coded signals to relay messages to each other, well, not exactly discreetly, but at least securely. Trying to decipher those signals led to a few unpleasant experiences, let me tell you. As for the town's wards, Oregon is fairly straightforward. Approaching the town from the east, like we are doing, means that the first buildings you are likely to see belong to the lumber lodges. Do not mistake these squalid, squat stone buildings for the marginally nicer infrastructure available to the consortium's local, permanent employees. No, the lumber lodges exist to house the countless seasonal workers that flock to the town during the felling season each year. For a copper a night, you too can enjoy the hospitality of a hard bed, a razor-thin blanket, and a meal of cold gruel and hot coffee come morning. In exchange for a season of backbreaking labour in Facedork forests, naturally. Do not fool yourself into thinking that the company puts its permanent employees in harm's way before its contractors. Directly south of the lodges are the lumber yards, occupying their own walled-off section of the town. Therein you will find warehouses, cut yards, and the offices of the consortium itself. The actual quotidian labour is overseen by one Kedrog Deadknuckle, a hard-headed man whose hands have been scarred from a thousand scrapes against the company's saw blades. He employs a number of private guards, read mercenaries, to patrol the yards day and night. These villains are called tooth knockers by the locals. I will leave it to your imagination as to why. Moving northwards brings us to the smelting yards, the only part of town capable of resisting the Lumber Consortium's power. While the overwhelming majority of Oregon's economic output takes the form of processed lumber and adjacent goods and services, the smelting yards are the exception. The town can boast of a small but secure metal and glass industry, often making use of equipment abandoned and repurposed by the dwarven kingdoms of old that used to rule the Vale. Employment opportunities are rather limited though, for dwarven engineering eliminates many menial tasks, but most locals prefer the smelting yards to the lumber yards, opportunities permitting. West of the smelting yards lies the Oregon Base, a small fortress integrated into the town. Originally a triplet of smaller forts built as a staging ground for the Vale's defence, over time these merged into the single, somewhat sprawling complex seen today. In Chalaxian times, the local garrison's philosophy was that the best defence is a good offence, and consequently it was quite common for the soldiers stationed here to sally forth on raids into the surrounding area, attacking the local goblinoid tribes or hunting shadow pack members in Arthfell Forest. These days, the base is instead occupied by a small number of Golden Legionnaires, who mostly limit themselves to patrolling the streets. Their loyalty is to the central government and not the consortium, but their numbers are far too few to make any real difference to the status quo. The northwesternmost ward of the town is called the Old Quarter, and it is constructed around a large bell tower that dominates the skyline. Merchants prefer to sell their wares from the surrounding square, and consequently the Old Quarter is considered the wealthiest part of town. In truth, though, no part of Oregon is truly wealthy, especially not when compared to towns farther south. Still, if you do need to find a specific item or an inn for the night, you should try your luck in the Old Quarter first. Finally, we come to the southern half of Oregon. Everything west of the inner wall that isolates the lumberyards is dubbed the Squats. In any other settlement, the narrow, ramshackle streets would be considered the slums. Here in Oregon, it is simply the main residential area. Few townsfolk have the privilege of owning their own homes, so most are constantly migrating from house to house as fortune and employment allow. Almost every Oregonian has their chest of belongings, large enough to store their few worldly goods but portable enough to haul over short distances. It is dangerous to linger in the squats after dark, 
because everyone knows that there are always chests to be looted there. Well, stranger, that is arrogant. I am sorry to have to paint such a bleak picture of the town. Naturally, it does have its fair share of nicer, substantial buildings, but they are all owned by the Consortium, the Golden Legion, or the Elite. I think it might blunt your appetite for touring to be in this town for too long, so we will remain for only today. We'll disembark by the old quarter, find room and board off the main square, and leave by horse and carriage tomorrow morning. The business I have in the town should be concluded in short order. It is uh, unfinished business, you see. Anyway, I will seek you in whatever inn we choose. Enjoy the city as best you can, but do not linger too long. And try not to irritate the consortium too quickly. Well, until then. <laughs>